5.6 Lesson 1, The Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. Our objectives for today are 1. You will understand the statement of the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus and know what it can be used for. 2. You will know how to use the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. And 3 is just an extension of 2 where you will be able to use the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus and in doing so define an antiderivative of the integrand, you may have to use integration for substitution for integration by substitution for some problems. So as you can see here, our vocabulary is the new theorem that we're learning today called the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, we've seen these terms before, integrand, lower limit of integration, upper limit of integration, antiderivative, and integration by substitution. So we will begin with objective one. You will understand the statement of the fundamental theorem of calculus and know what it can be used for. So here we have the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, it doesn't matter that it's theorem 4.9 or whatever the case may be. That just depends on the textbook. But all throughout mathematics, this is known as the fundamental theorem of calculus. So if you have a function f that is the integrand in a definite integral where the lower limit of integration is a and the upper limit of integration is b and you know that the integrand the function f is continuous on the closed interval from a to b and you are able to find an antiderivative of the integrand uppercase f is the function whose derivative will give you the integrand uppercase F is an antiderivative of the integrand for all values of X on the interval from A to B. Then look at what this fundamental theorem of calculus tells us. It tells us that the value of the definite integral, the exact value of the definite integral is equal to the antiderivative of the integrand evaluated at the upper limit of integration B minus the antiderivative evaluated at the lower limit of integration A. So now we have a theorem that allows us to find the exact value of a definite integral. If you were interested in reading about the proof of this theorem, then you can refer to section 5.6 of your textbook but this is how it goes. I will tell you the general outline of the proof. The proof ultimately relies on this definition of what a definite integral is. You take the limit of the lower Riemann sums as the norm of the partition approaches zero, and you take the limit of the upper Riemann sums as the norm of the partition approaches zero, and you see if those two limits are equal to each other, then that is what we mean by the value of the def definite integral. And of course, we had a lesson where we tried to understand this idea graphically, and we looked at partitions where the number of subintervals got larger and larger, and the width of the largest subinterval got smaller and smaller, and we saw that our approximations for the value of the definite integral tended to get better uh, with increasing numbers of subintervals and with the width of the largest subinterval approaching zero. So this is definitely used in the proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus. But this is uh, what you need as a part of the proof, but you actually have to build up to it, and you'll see this when you read your textbook. The textbook goes over the idea that if you choose sample points very carefully, you can have a constant Riemann sum regardless of the number of subintervals. And then it takes this idea and uses the mean value theorem to really come up with a nice little neat formula for the value of r sub n, which is an, a Riemann sum with n subintervals. And then once you have that, uh, it is then 
applied together with this definition of a definite integral and in something called the squeeze theorem to come up with the proof of this fundamental theorem of calculus. We will now take a look at some examples for using the fundamental theorem of calculus and some of our examples will require us to use integration by substitution to find an antiderivative of the integrand. Our first example is the definite integral of x squared plus 3x with respect to x from x is equal to 0 to x is equal to 2. We want to find the exact value of this definite integral and we will do that by using the fundamental theorem of calculus. Our integrand is a continuous function on the closed interval from 0 to 2. So what we need to do is find an antiderivative of the integrand and evaluate the antiderivative at 2 and at 0 and subtract. So I would like to point out the notation that you should use as you proceed with the steps for your work. As soon as you find the antiderivative of the integrand, you will use a different notation. So let's find the antiderivative of the integrand first. We have two terms in the integrand, so we will find the antiderivative term by term. So for x squared, you will use the power rule for integration. Add three add 1 to the exponent to get 3 and divide by the new exponent. And for 3x, uh, 3 is a constant, so you can leave that alone. And for the x term, add 1 to the exponent to get 2 and divide by the new exponent. So once you have found the antiderivative, and for definite integral problems, you don't need to write plus c. The reason why you don't need to write plus c is because using the fundamental theorem of calculus, you're going to be subtracting f of b minus f of a. So if you have plus c here, you'll just end up subtracting it when you do the subtraction. So it'll just go away. So you don't really need it. So, but the point that I want to make in addition to what I just said about the constant of integration is, as soon as you find the antiderivative, you no longer write this you no longer write this. This is only used to write the definite integral. When you find the antiderivative, this is the notation that you use. You put it in brackets. You write the upper limit of integration and the lower limit of integration as follows. And then you will just go ahead and evaluate the antiderivative at the upper limit of integration to at the lower limit of integration, 0, and subtract. So this is all you've got to do. So you're going to have 2 cubed over 3 plus 3 times 2 squared over 2 minus, so this is f of b minus f of a, minus 0 cubed over 3 plus 3 times 0 squared over 2. So this is just going to be 0 here. So you're just subtracting 0. So we will just have 2 cubed is 8 over 3. And then we have 2 squared, which is 4. 4 divided by 2 is 2. 3 times 2 is 6. And then, of course, minus 0 but minus 0 is not going to make a difference. So we just have 8 over 3 plus 6, which we can write as 8 over 3 plus 18 over 3 is 6. 18 plus 8 is 26. So we have 26 over 3. That is the exact value of the definite integral. Now we take a look at number 2, and notice that we have our integrand is cosine of t, so we're integrating with respect to t. Uh, so that makes no difference. We can have in the integrand as a function of x and integrate with respect to x. 
or we can have the function the integrand as a function of t and integrate with respect to t it makes no difference so now we'll just go ahead and take a look at how to do this problem like we did for number one so the first step is to find an antiderivative of the integrand so the function whose derivative is cosine is sine so the antiderivative with respect to t would be sine of t but again as soon as you write the antiderivative you need to change your notation and now you will apply the fundamental theorem of calculus and this is how you should show your work for each problem you're going to evaluate the antiderivative at the upper limit of integration and at the lower limit of integration and you will subtract so we're going to have sine of pi over 2 minus sine of 0 sine of pi over 2 is 1 minus sine of 0 is 0 so the value of this definite integral is 1 so we have number 3 here the definite integral of the square root of 2x plus 1 with respect to x from x is equal to 0 to x is equal to 3 and again what you need to do is you need to find an antiderivative of the integrand so you may begin by rewriting the integrand using the fact that when you have square root you can write that as to the one-half power and this is a problem where you could either try to find the antiderivative mentally or you could try to do it formally by using integration by substitution so you can see that you have a composition of two functions where the inside function is 2x plus 1 so you're going to write let u be equal to 2x plus 1 then du would be equal to the derivative of 2x plus 1 is 2 times the differential dx now I see dx here but I don't see a 2 so I will multiply both sides of the equation by 1 half to get dx by itself on the right side so one thing that you can do here when you're doing definite integration problems is you can also change the limits of integration this is x is equal to 0 this is x is equal to 3 but when you change variables from x to u you would no longer have these limits of integration what would you have instead you have to look here to answer that question when x is equal to 0 u would be equal to 2 times x plus 1 that's our substitution so you have 2 times 0 plus 1 u would be equal to 1 when x is equal to 3 u would be equal to using our substitution 2 times x plus 1 2 times 3 plus 1 u would be equal to 6 plus 1 or 7 so when you do your change of variables step you should also change the limits of integration so we will now have the definite integral from u is equal to 1 to u is equal to 7 again I want to emphasize that this is now u is equal to 1 and u is equal to 7 and we will have u in we write u in place of 2x plus 1 to the 1 half and dx will be replaced with 1 half du and I can of course factor out the 1 half so now this is my problem and I can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus to it I need to find an antiderivative of the integrand and how will I do that I will add 1 to the exponent 1 half plus 1 is 3 halves and divide by the new exponent of 3 over 2 
So when I divide by 3 over 2, that's the same as multiplying by 2 over 3. And I will now evaluate my antiderivative at the upper and lower limits of integration. And again, it's very important for you to understand that because I have everything in terms of u, the limits of integration also need to be in terms of u. The other option, if you don't want to change the limits of integration, is just to find an antiderivative, go back to x, and use the original limits of integration. And I'll show you that with my next example. So here we have 1 half times 2 thirds times 7 to the 3 halves minus 2 thirds times 1 to the 3 halves, which, which is just 1. And of course, 2 thirds times 1 is just 2 thirds. You can factor out the 2 thirds if you'd like. And if you do that, you'll just have 7 to the 3 halves here minus, because I factored out 2 thirds, I'll just have 1 there. And 1 half times 2 thirds is 1 third. So this is our final answer. And notice that because I changed the limits of integration from the values that I had for x to the values I should have for u, I did not have to go back to x to find the value of the definite integral. This is, in fact, the value of the definite integral that we began with. If you don't want to do this step, I will show you how to do that in the next example. But in that case, you would have to go back to x, and you would have to leave these values empty when you do your change of variables, because it would be incorrect to write 0 and 3 at this step. So we take a look at number 4 here, and again, you may be able to do this mentally so that you don't really need to do a formal integration by substitution. Or if you want to, you can let u be equal to the inside function 5x. If that's the case, then you would write the, down the steps that you do for your integration by substitution. But because of the differential of u being equal to 5 dx, you will have to compensate for that when you find the antiderivative. So if you want to find this mentally, you know that an antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine, so an antiderivative of positive sine would have to be negative cosine. So you're going to write negative cosine of 5x. But if you just leave it like this, and you check your work by differentiating, the derivative of the outside function will give you sine, and then you'll get sine of 5x, but then this is a composition of two functions. So you'll use the chain rule, and the derivative of this function will actually be 5 times sine of 5x, instead of just sine of 5x. And of course, the derivative needs to match the integrand. So we need to adjust for the antiderivative by multiplying it by 1 fifth, so that when we differentiate using the chain rule, the derivative of the inside function 5 will cancel with the 1 fifth, and we will just get what we had to begin with. So our antiderivative should be negative 1 fifth times cosine of 5x. And we're going to evaluate this at the upper and lower limits of integration. When we do that, we will have negative one-fifth times cosine of 5 times pi over 2, 5 times x, minus negative one-fifth times cosine of 
5 times 0, which is 0. And what is cosine of 5 pi over 2? Cosine of 5 pi over 2 is equal to 0. So we have negative 1 fifth times 0 minus negative 1 fifth times cosine of 0. Cosine of 0 is equal to 1. So we have negative 1 fifth times 1 here. And what is that equal to? Well, this is 0. And then you have minus negative 1 fifth, which is the same as plus 1 fifth. So the answer here is 1 fifth. Our next example is number 5, and we have the definite integral of tangent cubed x times secant squared x with respect to x from x is equal to 0, and listen to me say from x is equal to 0 to x is equal to pi over 4. These are values for x. And we need to use the fundamental theorem of calculus to find the value of this definite integral. We need to find uh, we need to find an antiderivative of the integrand. You do want to make sure that the integrand is continuous on the closed interval from 0 to pi over 4. And for this integrand, it is continuous on the closed interval from 0 to pi over 4. So now we can proceed using the fundamental theorem of calculus we need to find an antiderivative of the integrand and evaluate at the upper and lower limits of integration. Now you may be able to find the antiderivative mentally or if you're not able to do it you can do uh, an integration by substitution by writing down the substitution. So we can let u be equal to tangent x. Then the differential of u would be the derivative of tangent x, which is secant squared x, multiplied by the differential dx. And the reason why this substitution works out is because we will be able to do our change of variables because we can replace secant squared x dx with du. And we can replace tangent with u, so we will basically have u cubed du. Now, remember, these are x values. x is equal to 0 and x is equal to pi over 4. So here's what you can do. You can let, we, we can say that when x is equal to 0, u must be equal to the tangent of x, the tangent of 0. That's our substitution. The tangent of 0 would be sine of 0 over cosine of 0 which is 0. What about when x is equal to pi over 4? Then u must be equal to the tangent of pi over 4 and the tangent of pi over 4 is equal to 1. So when you change variables, if you want to include your limits of integration make sure that you are changing the values of your limits of integration to what they would be for the variable u. So now we will have the definite integral from u is equal to 0 to u is equal to 1 and we will replace tangent with u so we will have u cubed and then we will replace secant squared dx with du. So now we find an antiderivative of the integrand using the power rule for integration. Add 1 to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. We use this new notation. Evaluate the antiderivative at the upper and lower limits of integration and we will have 
Again, we, know, we don't have to go back to x anymore because we've changed the limits of integration for the new variable u, and this will give us 1 fourth minus 0, which is, of course, 1 fourth. And this is equal to the value of the definite integral that we, that we began with. So for our last example today, we're also going to have to use the fundamental theorem of calculus. We need to find an antiderivative of the integrand, and we may use integration by substitution. We can see that we have the square root of x squared plus 5. It's a composition of two functions, where the inside function is x squared plus 5, and the outside function is square root, or raising to the 1 half power. So we may let u be equal to the inside function x squared plus 5, then the differential of u will be the derivative of x squared plus 5 is 2x. Multiply that by the differential dx. And this works out nicely because we have 2x dx here. And suppose you don't want to change your limits of integration, and you want to keep them 0 and 1. If that's the case, and we've done it the other way for the prior examples, but if you don't want to change the limits of integration, when you change variables, you cannot write 0 and 1, because that's for x. And if you're going to u and you don't want to change the limits of integration, you've got to just leave that blank and just find an antiderivative in terms of u and then go back to x and then do the problem with your antiderivative in terms of x with the original limits of integration. So if you don't want to change the limits of integration, here's how you would proceed. Leave this blank, treat it as an indefinite integral, find an antiderivative, go back to x, and then use 0 and 1. So we will now have 2x dx is going to become du, so we have the square root of u du. And you can, of course, write the square root of u as u to the 1 half. And to find an antiderivative, you will use the power rule. So you will have u to the, add 1 to the exponent, u to the 3 halves, divide by 3 halves, which is the same as multiplying by 2 thirds, uh, plus c. And then you have 2 thirds, go back to x, replace u with x squared plus 5, and raise that to the 3 halves power, plus c. So now you have your antiderivative of the integrand in terms of x, so you can go back to your definite integral problem using the fundamental theorem of calculus. So you're going to write 2 thirds times x squared plus 5 to the 3 halves, evaluated at the upper and lower limits of integration of 1 and 0. So now you will have 2 thirds times 1 squared is 1, 1 plus 5 is 6, so I have 6 to the 3 halves, minus 2 thirds times 0 squared is 0, 0 plus 5 is 5, so I have 5 to the 3 halves. And, of course, you can factor out the 2 thirds, and if you do that, you'll have just 6 to the 3 halves minus 5 to the 3 halves, and you may leave it like this. And that would be your final answer, giving you the value of the definite integral. I could have also factored out the 2 thirds at this step, and then just evaluated this part of the antiderivative at 1 and 0 and subtracted, I would have had the same thing. So today we understood the statement of the fundamental theorem of calculus and we learned what it can be used for and we saw some examples for using the fundamental theorem of calculus and for some of our problems to find the needed antiderivative we had to use integration by substitution.